All right, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you all uh, for coming. <laughs> this is the uh, second program of our, um, of the, um, what are we, the Bristol Community College Holocaust and Genocide Center. Some of you know, may have been there, we are collecting 1.5 million buttons. We've already collected around 600,000. And you probably saw down, so if you didn't notice it, when you leave, we have two portraits made up of those buttons, one of Anne Frank and one of Stephen uh, Ross, who is a survivor, who actually spoke here about three years ago. And they're incredible portraits made up all of the buttons by our art department. Uh, so um, that's just the beginning of what we're going to hopefully be doing with those buttons. But they represent the 1.5 million children who were murdered, Jewish children, who were murdered during the Holocaust. And we have people... Uh, we have the local Catholic high school collected 17,000 buttons. Uh, Bishop Conley, <clears throat> another school in Fairhaven, collected 22,000 buttons. And we have people, almost every day that I come in, to, we have an office second floor of the library, there's some buttons waiting for me. And we have volunteers who are now putting the buttons, uh, counting them. So we, we'll have a grand total. So if any of you have buttons, pl please, um, we're more than, we still have 900,000 to go. And I think we're the only place in the country that's doing the buttons. Some people did paper clips, some people did stamps, but we're doing buttons. And, and those um, portraits are just amazing. So take a little minute and notice them. Uh, I asked the art department if they could um, do something and they spent all summer putting together these two portraits. Anyway, um, I'm very pleased as always to see we have people here from our college and people from the community. Uh, President Laura Douglas would have liked to be here, but she had to be away, so she wanted me to bring greetings from the college. Um, the college is very supportive of our, what we're doing. And um, we do, um, we throw in, we do uh, our, the money that we get to do what we do. Some of it comes from the college, but most of it comes from, from people who have donated money. And the Jewish Federation of New Bedford is one of our biggest uh, contributors, which we really appreciate, and our the Federation has a Holocaust, uh, what do you call it, uh, committee, and uh, Cindy Okins here in the front row, the husband Mel, she's a co-chair, no, Manya Barkin, and uh, <clears throat> they do uh, great work, I'm, I'm part of that, and we, uh, they work with people in the, uh, in the community, in the schools, and that's what we're doing, we're also working, in addition to, um, bringing in speakers, you'll see, we also are doing workshops. We have a workshop, a conference on women in the Holocaust, which will be uh, April 12th, so all day Friday, I hope many of you can attend. We have, I think you may have picked up flyers which listed our program. <clears throat> our next program is um, by Carol Anger, who is a concert pianist, but has done an amazing program called the Mischling Project. Mischlings are, you know, uh, people that the Germans designated as part Jews. And her mo mother was in that category. And she's put together a multimedia program on this category of Jews, some of whom were murdered, others got out. And it's called the Mischling Project. So that's gonna be April 7th. So April 7th, April 12th is our next, next program. Um, so anyway, we, we appreciate all the support that we do get uh, from our con contributors and our people who volunteer. We have uh, Heidi Cipriano, you may have seen down there, and Judy and Gary Brown, who are vol volunteers who uh, help me. I'm a, sometimes a one-man show, but I'm actually a three or four people show. Um, so... Um, the other thing I wanted to welcome, we have a class, Dr. Howard Tinberg sitting there in the vest. He and I have been teaching a, a course on the Holocaust, an honors course. This is our 16th year. And uh, this whole program came out of that, uh, as well as with the Jewish Federation. And uh, by the way, we also have books and artifacts, second floor of the library. You're also welcome to come borrow our books. Eventually, they're going to be downstairs in the library in the special section. Um, hmm? Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
no, we have our former president, Dr. Jack Sprague, who's in the back. Thank you. President here for us, 17 years, right? Uh, we've been fortunate. We've only had, uh, we all, we're on our fourth president, which is unusual for, we're over uh, 50, I don't know how many years now, 55 years. So um, anyway, thank, thank you all for coming. Um, so anyway, I wanted to welcome our, that's what I started, I wanted to welcome our class. So we have members of our Holocaust class called Remembering the Holocaust in Literature and History that uh, Howard Timberg and I do. Uh, we even wrote a book about it once upon a time. Uh, um, but it's a wonderful class and we have a great class and they're going to, they're here. And then um, Marsha has been um, kind enough to come to our class afterwards and we'll be meeting with the students in a more informal basis. So I think I th thanked everybody, I hope, if I didn't. So I want to uh, introduce our speaker and I did this phonetically, so I don't. <laughs> I'm testing you on this. I know, Marsha Icon Nomopoulos. Yeah, you're going to have to try again. Okay. <laughs> Marsha Icon. Forget the icon, think of the economy. Uh, Anopoulos? Economy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I've been practicing, but you know. Um, anyway, Marsha is uh, from New York City. She drove in this morning. Um, she has a um, long history of working in Holocaust, um, in Holocaust education. She has a BA uh, from Brooklyn College. She has a master's. Uh, she actually had two BAs, one from um, Brooklyn College, one from Queens. Uh, she has a master in Italian from Queens. And a, um, she's been president of the, or is president of the Association of Friends of Greek Jewry. It's a whole area that we don't know as much about, we will find out. She's a muse museum director of the Kehillah Kadosha Jaina Synagogue and Museum in the Lower East Side, is it? Yanana. Yeah. yeah. Yanana. Yeah. Boy. I'm Yan I should have known that from Judy, but I messed <laughs> up on that. Yanana. Um, you may want to visit. She'll talk about that, right, down in New York. She's a teacher of Judaic studies, and she's a translator of Greek Jewish Holocaust memoirs has written a whole, she's an author of a number of books, including I Remember the Jews of Corfu, Story Behind the Statistics, Voices from Salonika Archives, and many others. Um, she's also the editor of a journal, Yanina, Journey to the Past and the Memory of the Jewish Community of Yanina. I think I won't forget that now. You're never going to forget that. <laughs> so, she's an expert in this area. We're looking forward to hearing her, Marsha. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. You don't need me in stereo over here. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for inviting me. Judy and Gary, love you. Thank you so much. Stephen, good seeing you. I have people with vested interest here today. Um, we are a very small community of Greek Jews, and for the most part, people do not know our story. They didn't even know that Jews were in Greece, and it's actually the longest continuous Jewish presence in the European diaspora. I'll speak to educated people, and they'll say to me, do you mean Greece was involved in World War II? Evidently, they didn't see the movie, The Guns of Navarone, you know. So I'm here to pay a debt to my grandmother of blessed memory, who set me on my path in life. She wanted me to find out what happened to our family. I think she really wanted me to find out who I was. So that was the beginning of my journey, my odyssey. And I'm going to take you along with me now for some of the fine points. Just to preface this lecture, my family lost 112 members of their extended family in Salonika. My grandfather was the only surviving member of his family because he went to Haifa after there was a major fire in Salonika. <clears throat> 
My grandmother was pregnant with my mother. She smuggled her in to Israel. But that's okay. My mother smuggled me into the United States afterwards. We have a history of that in the family. <laughs> I grew up under the cloud of the Holocaust. At times it was a silent cloud because it was never spoken about. The devastation was so tremendous that my grandfather became a recluse. He went into a darkened room. He burned all the family pictures. He couldn't bear to look at them. I think one of the main reasons I became a museum director is I precariously lived through the photographs of others because we didn't have any. I fulfilled, I hope I fulfilled my promise to my grandmother. I started on my journey of independent research back in 1973. I've been going to Greece practically every year since. It's a tough job. Somebody has to do it. You know? <laughs> and by the way, I take tours to Jewish Greece over through the museum and the Association of Friends of Greek Jewry. I brought in limited copies of our latest Roman Yote newsletter. So those of you who are, get a copy, if you want a copy, I'll send one to you. We're very proud of what we do. We're very proud in a number of ways. When we opened our doors on Broome Street, we were the 404th synagogue on the Lower East Side, just south of Houston. There were about another 300 between Houston and East 14th Street. We are now one of only four that still remain open as a functioning Jewish house of worship from that period. There are many exclamation points in our story. The longest continuous Jewish presence in the European diaspora going back to the time of Alexander the Great. And unfortunately, the largest percentage of Jews lost in the Holocaust. While, of course, Poland lost three million of its three and a half million uh, Jewish population, if you can use the word only in this context, it was only 84% of Polish Jewry. Greece lost 87%. And we lost those to tell the story. So I'm here as a surrogate today. Roman Yo Jews. This is the true orphan child of Holocaust studies. Romano Jews are Greek-speaking Jews who have the distinction of the longest continuous Jewish presence in the European diaspora. While they include, were, are included under the umbrella category of Sephardim, and that's a very strange category, by the way, simply what happened after World War II, uh, Israel, decided that whoever were not Ashkenazi Jews would go under this ever-growing category of Sephardic Jews. So in my world, true Sephardim were those that came from Spain. Now they can come from North African countries, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt. They can come from Yemen. They can come from Iran. They can come from Iraq. If you notice a tinge of annoyance in what I'm telling you, I feel it's an injustice to these very separate, precious cultures to put them all together. I like to look at it as a beautiful multicolored quilt and each patch is important and should stand distinctly on its own. Intermingled with those patches under this umbrella are Romano Jews, who certainly have a very distinct history, custom, and traditions. I want to place Romano and Sephardic Jews within the bigger picture of the Holocaust. By the way, the figures I'm going to tell you now have recently changed due to research being done by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. The figures are greater. Well, we always say 11 million total victims of the Holocaust, there's more like 13 million now. Well, we usually say 6 million of them were Jews, it's more like 7 million. 
An estimated 58% of all Jews in Europe were killed during the Holocaust. Of those, 210,000 um, 210, Sephardic and Romano Jews only were an estimated 3% of all Jews murdered in the Holocaust. Of those murdered, only 7,000 <coughs> were Roman Yotes. So why am I taking your precious time to discuss these small numbers? We tell these stories because they're our stories. And if we don't tell them, no one else will. Greece entered World War II on October 28, 1940, which is known as Ochi Day because of the resounding Ochi, no, that the Metasax, the then dictator of Greece, came out with when told by the Italians that they were going to invade Greece through the border of Albania. This is known as the Albanian Front. I guess I'm better off going up there, okay. Right over here you can see where the border is between Albania and Greece. Here's Greece. This is the Albanian Front. By the way, Janina is right over here. The Greeks fought so fiercely against the invading Italians. Mind you, in all of Greece at that time, there were only seven and a half million citizens, while in Italy, there were 58 million. The Italians not only outnumbered the Greeks, but their weapons were much more sophisticated. And yet, the Greeks held back the Italians. It was the first time that fascist forces had been blocked from what they wanted to do. It made the headlines of the newspapers. Uh, it made, uh, this was a photo from Life magazine. Hence, we will not say that Greeks fight like heroes, but that heroes fight like Greeks. When the Germans came to the aid of their Italian allies, it was all over. The Germans entered Greece through the border of Bulgaria, another ally of theirs, and the first city, city they entered was Thessaloniki or Salonika. They then divided the country into three zones of occupation, and if you were a Jew, where you were living became very important. The Germans took a chunk of Macedonia with the city of Salonika, part of Crete, and shared with the Italians Athens. At that time, Salonika was the most populous center of Sephardic Jews in the world. A one third the population of the city were Jewish. 57,000 Jews lived in Salonika. By the way, it's officially called Thessaloniki, Salonika, and my family called it by the Turkish way, Selenik. The Germans then gave their Bulgarian allies the further up north, it was the north, oh, wrong way. It was over here, the northeastern part of Greece, which is known as Thraki. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Bulgarians later on, because it's really a very sore spot with me. If anything, the worst statistics came out of the Bulgarian zone of occupation. 98 to 99% of the Jews living there perished. They were sent to Treblinka. The part that you're seeing on the map now in blue, this was the Italian zone of occupation. And the Italians did not have the same mission as the Germans. They were very reluctantly involved in persecution of Jews. And for the most part, the Jews that lived in the Italian zone of occupation lived with an illusion of safety. The official occupation of Greece dated from April of 1941 until October of 1944. This is a picture of the Germans coming into the city of Thessaloniki. 
During that period, from April of 1941 to October of 1944, almost the entire population of Salonika was destroyed and 87% of Greek Jews perished. The destruction of Sephardic communities in Greece, while the majority of the Jews in the Balkans were Sephardim, their stories are not all the same. Salonika was the most popular center of Sephardic Jews in the world. At the time of World War II, 57,000 Jews lived in Salonika. 97 perished in the Holocaust. 112 members of my Herrera family perished there and another 12 members of my Russo family perished in Kavala. This was an order that was put out in July of 1942. The Germans came into Salonika in April of 1941, but not too much changed. They were getting statistics. They wanted to know where the things were that they wanted to take. They took the census books of the Jewish community of Salonika, very meticulous census books. The rabbi at that time was Rabbi Koretz, who actually was Austrian, and he became a very controversial figure. Many felt he was a collaborator. I don't think he was, I just feel he was a very weak leader. He told the Jews to obey whatever the Germans wanted them to do. This particular order was the roundup of all men between the ages of 18 and 45. In Platea Eleftherius, Freedom Square, what an irony. On a hot summer day in July of 1942, they were gathered there and made to do degrading gymnastics. They couldn't wear their hats. They were beaten by the Germans. And in the balconies were the wives of the German officers. That's where these pictures came from. It was a show for them. The men were rounded up for forced conscripted labor. Many of them died or came back injured. And to ransom them, the Jewish community of Salonika made the decision to raise money to allow the city of Thessaloniki to take over their burial ground in exchange for the money to pay the Germans. It's a very dirty story. There were over 450,000 tombstones dating back to 1492. If you walk through Salonika now, you can still see some of those tombstones used as building materials, used in sidewalk, used in foundations of churches. There's been a lot written about it. And now, on the grounds of the university that was built on the grounds of the former Jewish cemetery, a memorial was set up to acknowledge the fact that on these grounds once stood a Jewish cemetery. Just recently, that memorial was severely vandalized. It will be repaired, and as the mayor of Salonika has said, they can destroy it a hundred times, and we will replace it a hundred times. They have to put up better security, but the Jewish community doesn't want to do that. They don't want to have to feel that they have to put security at a site of a memorial. I wish I could agree with him. This is the railroad station where 47,091 Jews from Thessaloniki were taken, rounded up between March 15th of 1943 and July 11th of 1943. Only of those that went to the camps only 1,200 returned. These are some of the survivors showing their numbers. There became almost a pride 
in their survival, and justifiably so. In the new cemetery that was established in Thessaloniki, when a survivor perished, on his tombstone, in addition to his name and his date of death and an appropriate prayer, were the numbers that had been engraved on his arm. Many of them also had the names of their relatives that perished engraved on the tombstone because it would be the only place that would physically acknowledge their demise. There were other smaller Sephardic communities, Castoria, Rhodes, Tricola, Laris, Averia, Cavalla, Drama, Xanthi, Limatico. Bulgaria's complicity. You know, I have often said, for Bulgaria to acknowledge their complicity in the deportation and the death of Jews, you know, they're very proud of saying they saved all their Jews in Bulgaria. How many of you heard that story? Fine, you can put that one to rest. They saved the Jews that were physically living in Bulgaria. Those Jews that lived in the Bulgarian zone of occupation were rounded up by the Bulgarians. We have the pictures that testify to that and the eyewitness accounts. Placed in railroad cars, sent to the Danube River, the port of Loam, run over the Danube, wound up in Treblinka. I've often said for the Bulgarians to acknowledge their complicity in the death of Jews in Greece and former Yugoslavia would no way diminish the bravery that encompassed the saving of the Jews in Bulgaria, but not to acknowledge their complicity diminishes their humanity. This picture breaks my heart. This picture are Jews from Kavala. It could be my family. The mother innocently is happy her little daughter is having her picture taken. Of course, none of them survived. They was, to the blinker, you didn't go to work there. In Auschwitz, when you arrived at the camp, Jews who looked healthy were sent to work in the camp, work themselves to death, but to work with the possibility of survival. And those that could not, or at least in the German's mind, were too feeble to work, <coughs> would be sent directly to the gas chambers. Mothers <coughs> carrying a child would go with the child to the gas chambers. The elderly would go directly to the gas chambers. In Treblinka, everybody went to the gas chambers. Here's a picture of a Bulgarian soldier placing the Jews onto the train. This picture is of my friend Louise's great-grandfather. How many of us can say you have a picture of a relative? The last picture taken. He was the chief rabbi of Kavala, Rabbi Azuvi. He's being helped onto the barge by the Bulgarian soldiers. That barge would take him across the Danube. Final destination would be Treblinka. <coughs> On the other hand, a story that's rarely told and should be told more often, Albania, a truly righteous nation, a mostly Muslim country that saved all of its indigenous Jews and most of Jews that came from other countries, saved by the Muslims. This is where I get a little annoyed at politics. I mean, in this day and age we're living in now, we've got a lot to be annoyed with politics. <laughs> but Yad Vashem certainly should not be involved in politics. Why are there so few Muslim righteous among nations when we have documented stories from the island of Rhodes from Albania, from France, where a Muslim, Turkish Muslim ambassador risked his life to save Jews. And when they went on the train, he took them on the train and he said, these are all Turkish citizens and Turkey was neutral. So the Germans were not supposed to touch them. And he was willing to be rounded up with them 
if they insisted on taking them, why aren't these people honored at Yad Vashem? By the way, Albania, there were many Jews from Yanina that were there because there was no Albania until 1913. So there were many Jews that worked who were from Greece, what is now Greece, who worked in Albania. To Yanina. You know, <laughs> my roots are in Salonika, but I often say my heart is in Yanina. Uh, Judy and Gary, you were there, and you can understand how I feel. From the first time that I went there, the Jewish community wrapped themselves around my heart. A small community, not wealthy Jews, who had special stories to tell. I am personally deeply honored to be the museum director of Kalakadosha Yanada and to be the guardian of their family heirlooms and their precious stories. The center of Romano Greek speaking Jews was Yanada, but there were also Romano communities in Arta, Prevesa, Patra, Corfu, Athens, Chalkis, and Zakynthos. Zakynthos, everybody points it out as a very special story, and justifiably so, because in the midst of the horrific losses of the Holocaust in Greece, this island has become known as the Island of the Righteous. All 275 Jews on the island were saved by the Metropolitan Bishop and the Mayor, both of whom are honored at Yad Vashem as righteous among nations. The whole island should be honored because there was not a citizen on the island who did not know where Jews were hidden, and yet no one informed. This is my favorite picture of Yanina. Uh, I get very nostalgic when I'm there. This picture happened to be taken in 1948, but it could have been taken in 1914, or it could be taken now. Uh, Yanina is on a lake. I like to take my walk in the morning, and as the mist rises up from the lake, you get these really almost surrealistic pictures of the city. A charming little city that sits at the foothills of the Pindos mountain range on a natural lake. At the time that your family and your family lived there, this is what the market looked like. This is where they would go to buy their goods. And there were minarets of, of musks all over the city. There were only a very few left now. The Jews of Yanina, their relationship with the Christian population was quite good. You know, we like to think that everywhere in the world, Jews were persecuted. That's not necessarily the case. For some reason, the horrific stories of pogroms and persecutions that the Ashkenazim suffered, most people think it was that way all over. But it wasn't. Jews who were fortunate enough to live in what was then part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire led a very blessed existence. They were allowed to engage in most occupations. They didn't live in ghettos. There were some restrictions. They couldn't ride a horse because they might be higher than a Muslim. You know, if that was the only bad thing that ever happened to us, I think we could live with that, you know? They weren't supposed to become doctors, which was a joke because there wasn't a pasha or a sultan that didn't have a Jewish doctor. They weren't fools. There was no economic competition in Yanina, and therefore the Christians and the Jews lived very peacefully side by side. This happens to be a tavernum owned by a Jewish uh, family. This is from the Batiste family. Life was much simpler then. You didn't have to write out wedding invitations. Every Jew in the city was invited to the wedding. This is a typical wedding party here, coming out of one of the exits from the Castro. The Castro, very often the misnomer is castle. It's not a castle. It was a fortified area, initially built by the Venetians, refortified by the Byzantines, and then refortified afterwards again by the Ottoman Turks. And that's where most of the Jewish community lived. 
until the community outgrew the Castro and then started to live outside the Castro walls. The Ottoman Turks liked to keep the Jews inside the Castro, not as a ghetto, but they wanted to keep them separated from the Christian population, especially around the holidays. Simply put, the Christians and the Jews of Yanada were too much alike. When it was Easter, the Christians would throw things at the Jews. And when it was a Jewish holiday, the Jews would throw things at the Christians. There was, it wasn't really persecution. Was there ugliness involved? Of course there was. Was there anti-Semitism? Of course there was. But not in the way that was known in other parts of the world. This is a rabbi from Yanina walking through the streets. And you can take a look at those houses there because, you know, if you went today, they'll still look the same. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture of Nahum Matzis' family. By the way, it's interesting, the surnames of the Jews of Yanina have a great number of, of, of surnames that have to do with the holiday of Passover, Pesach, Matzah, Hametz, we actually have a family, the Hametz family. Um, this picture was found on the street. I have a man who does extra, excellent photoshopping on my photos. I said to him, don't clean this picture up. I want it left exactly what it is. Every one of those folds, every one of those lines tell a story. The picture was found on the street by a Christian neighbor. Evidently, someone had looted the house. The neighbor took the picture and kept it, hoping that someone from the family would return. Well, the little boy, oh, I'm, I know I'm not doing good here. The little boy in the picture, Nahum returned. The uh, gentleman in the back row, let me see if I can do it over here. No, it doesn't work, okay. He, okay, she went, she went to, the little girl went to Egypt, so she survived, she got married there. The man up here, he worked in a bank in Agrilia, and he survived, but everybody else perished. The Germans couldn't even leave the senior citizens in the old age home alone. I mean, what threat were they? Let's be serious. This is a picture from the senior home in Yanina, which was taken before the deportations. Is there anyone who's Greek here? What? Okay, great. March 25th, what's March 25th? You're not gonna march in the Greek Independence Day parade? Okay. March 25th is Greek Independence Day. The Germans specifically chose March 25th to round up the Jews of Yanina, Arta, Prevesa, Patra, Athens, Kalkis, Trikula, Volos, Vladisla, Kastoria, the largest deportation. They wanted to show the Greeks how meaningless their concept of independence was. So they chose March 25th as the date. Not only did they take the senior citizens, they took the children. This is Grazia Samuels. Uh, she, this picture was taken when she was about six years old. She perished in the camps at the age of 11. You know, I always used to say to myself, why the children? Why? But to the Germans, the children were more dangerous than the grown-ups. Because children married, and they had families, and they produced more children. They produced more Jews. And if you want to eradicate a whole group of people, you have to kill the children. You know, a little aside on this, my first degree was in psychology, and I was fascinated with a research project that was done at Nuremberg, where um, psychologists interviewed the Germans that were being tried at Nuremberg and asked them a number of questions. The most interesting ones were, what other nationality do you think would do the same thing as you. 
And even more interesting, what nationality do you think would never do what you did? On the second question, they all answered the Italians. Italians could never kill children, thank God. But the Germans were amazed that the Italians were so foolishly sensitive that they didn't understand the concept of the final solution. We have a series of photographs that were taken by a German paratrooper on the day of the deportation. We got the, the photographs from Koblenz, and they were published in a newspaper in Yanada, ironically on my birthday, it was my special birthday present. And we have been able to identify so many in the pictures. In this picture here, the lady with her back to us, oh, let me go again, with her back to us, her name is Stella Mionis Cohen. She's still alive. Strong, dynamic woman. Both her and her sister Eftekia survived. Her husband fought in the resistance movement. He recently passed away. Stella was interviewed by a TV show in Greece, and she was right in their face. She said, where were my good friends when they were taking us? Locked themselves inside their houses? Well, of course they did. The Germans, Germans made it very clear to anyone who tried to save the Jews that they would be killed. But then Stella went on. What had happened shortly before the interview is the president of Germany visited Yanina. And he wanted to meet a survivor. And the president of the Jewish community and the mayor in the city chose Stella. What a poor choice that was. Here you have the president of Germany. And when Stella went to meet him, she said, I'm not going to tell you my name. I'm going to show you the numbers on my arm. And don't apologize to me for Germany. The only ones that can accept your apology are no longer alive. I think they was regretted choosing her, <laughs> but good for Stella. This picture here I call the crying girl. On our website, if you go on with the Holocaust in Yanina, this picture comes up. I wanted to find out who she was. This picture tore my heart out. First place, she looked like so many of my friends that I know that came from Yanina. And secondly, that anguish on her face, captured by the German paratrooper. We put that on our, our web page. And you know, the internet can do wonders. A couple of years later, we got an email from a woman who was the granddaughter of Fanny Chaim. We found out her name. We found out her story. She couldn't go back to Yanina. She knew her family had been destroyed. She went to Athens. She wound up marrying a Christian there. She never told, she did not want anyone to know that she was Jewish. Of course, the numbers were on her arm. Her children knew, her grandchildren knew. She didn't want anyone to know because she feared that her children and her grandchildren would suffer because they had Jewish blood. I wrote an article in a newspaper and I was contacted by uh, England. It's, this is now part of the mandated Holocaust studies program in England, Fanny Chaim's story. How the Holocaust is a horror that never stops giving. Another picture of the Jews from Yanina taking their bundles. These were the women. If you go into the synagogue in Yanina, which was one of two synagogues in existence before World War II, the second one was destroyed because the Germans used it as a stable. This one here is a large, vast building 
in the style of Ottoman style synagogues with tall ceilings. Now the voices echo off the walls because rarely are there even services. On the walls are the 1,860 names of the Jews of Yanina that perished in the Holocaust. Painstakingly researched by a survivor of the camps and a man who survived by making it through Turkey to Israel. I call this picture our victory. All four women in these, this picture were survivors of the Holocaust. These are the first babies born in Yanina in 1946. These are also survivors, no longer with us. One thing that was so painful is after returning from the concentration camps, many of the Jewish men were constricted to serve in the Greek army during the Civil War, as if they didn't suffer enough in the camps. This is Kela Kadoshiana. <laughs> this is our synagogue. Um, this picture is taken at our annual Greek festival. This year it's going to be on May 19th. We close the street down. We have live Greek music from 12 to 6, dancing in the street, and kosher Greek Jewish food. Want to tell me who this is? You know, there were those whose ticket to survival for them and their families was coming to America. I'm going to cry, Judy, you know that. <laughs> this is Judy's father, Manny Asa, who passed away when he was 100, 100 years old. So Judy, you wouldn't be here if he didn't make that leap of faith and come to the United States. You know, I, I always say to my daughter, I have to stop, stop crying. And she says, Mom, when you stop crying, I'll stop worrying about you. <laughs> <laughs> Lost was not only lives, but especially in the case of Roman Yod and Sephardic Jews, language, traditions, customs. While the actual number of Ashkenazim murdered was so much greater, they still had those to tell the story. We lost the storytellers. It is now our responsibility to tell the story and make sure the world never forgets these precious communities of Sephardic and Roman Yod Jews. At a time when anti-Semitism is spreading, where hatred is rampant, we must continue to teach the lessons of the Holocaust. We must raise a generation of children who are not fearful of differences, but rather emphasize the humanity that we all share in common. When I speak to classes at the museum, I preach to the children. And I admonish the teachers. Forgive me. You know, most teachers like to fit their students in a neat little box. It makes it easier for them. We really have to raise a generation of anarchists. We have to raise a generation that doesn't follow the crowd, that thinks for themselves. I want to thank you for allowing me to share my story. May their memory be for a blessing. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Okay. Yeah. Questions? I hope you have some questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, quite a few years ago, I was on a trip uh, to Turkey. And uh, I remember him mentioning the close relationship between the uh, Jews of Thessalonia and Turkey, and that how, um, while so many Greek Jews perished, that the Jews of Turkey, again in a Muslim country, right. were free from the uh, much of that persecution, and yet how close they were mm -hmm. in, in the culture, in the sharing before the war. And yeah. Can you speak to that? that uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's um, so much has to do with fate. 
there was, you know, up until 1913, 1912 and 1913, so much of what is now Greece was part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And those Jewish communities there, if they had physically been in Turkey, would have not been deported because Turkey was neutral at that time. The fate of someone who decides to come from Istanbul and gets married with someone from Kavala, as happened in my own family, if only they had reversed the situation and gone from Kavala to Istanbul, their descendants would still be alive. But, you know, I hate to tarnish the beautiful picture of Turkey, but um, my father never called himself a Turkino, which is usually the name that Sephardic Jews who come from Turkey or the Ottoman Turkish Empire call themselves. Because in 1942, Turkey leveled a capital tax. Simply put, they, did, they were neutral, but they didn't know if they were going to be attacked by the Axis or by the Allies. And they wanted to raise money to defend themselves. The tax, not that it fell heavier on the Jews, but it made things much more difficult for them. Because you had to pay the tax in cash. And most of the Jews did not have liquid assets. So that's the point at which my father, in 1942, left Turkey to marry uh, my mother, his first cousin, by the way. <laughs> yeah. uh, my, my family tree is a tangled bush. <laughs> yeah. That's clever. But, um, so because of that, he left, and he never spoke fondly of the Turks. I'm very proud of my father. My father died in the Israeli War of Independence. I never really knew him, but the stories I've heard about him, <coughs> He was Haganah. He also worked with the former mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kolek, in a clandestine operation to get Jews who were coming in from Greece into <coughs> Turkey and then on to, as it was called then, Palestine. So in his short life, he accomplished quite a bit. Uh, the, the, uh, saying that across <coughs> Turkey and, and Greece, we're natural enemy. I mean, they, they not always. Not always. But, no. But but the Jews, they live so close. But yeah. they, they well, you know, okay, we, we talk about two different things now. Now, Jews were not given citizenship of Turkey uh, until it became a modern country. Under the Ottoman Turkish Empire, they did have, not have any Turkish na nationality. And um, in Greece, until Greece became a modern state, Jews there did not have a nationality either. Those that were, came, were living in parts of Greece in 1821 during the Greek War of Independence, they became Greek citizens immediately with the Constitution in, in 1860. But so very often you had members of the same family fighting each other. Take the Balkan Wars. The first Balkan War, everybody was against Turkey. But guess what? In the Second Balkan War, Greece sided with Turkey against the Serbs. So they weren't always enemies. Um, more times than not, they were. And now, because of the terrible relationship between Israel and Turkey, we have more Israelis that come to Greece than ever before because uh, they're not going to Turkey anymore. Any other questions? Yes. What about anti-Semitism in Greece? I've always wondered what the fascist colonel's position were. Many people left Greece because of them. Mm -hmm. How did it affect the Jews or their position? Okay. Well, I'll give you, when I went to Greece in, um, during the time of the colonels, I was there, and written across the airport in Greek, which at that point, unfortunately, I could read, is Greek, Greece is for Greek Christians. So I said to myself, what about me, you know? Um, you know, ignorance has no national borders. Um, for the most, and I used to 
naively think that with education we could eradicate anti-Semitism, but some of the worst anti-Semitic comments I've ever heard are from quote-unquote educated people. The, um, the fact is, there's, there's so, you know, so much gets involved with this. Uh, is there anti-Semitism in, in Greece? Was there anti-Semitism in Greece? Of course, there's anti-Semitism everywhere. Look what's happening in our own country now. What troubles me is what makes the headlines. Negativity sells newspapers. I point to what happened in Greece. It was in 2009. We had a horrendous vandalism of the Jewish cemetery in Yanina. A very vicious attack where they destroyed tombstones of, peop of the graves where there were still living relatives in the city to, to really inflict the most pain possible. That went all over the newspapers. Um, organizations that tried to raise money because they're going to save us from anti-Semitism, like Simon Wiesenthal was sending out their appeal. Um, I have trouble with Jewish organizations that pay their leaders so much money to save us. Really? Um, anyway, what was never printed in the newspaper was what happened with the Greek Christian citizens of the city afterwards. They marched from the Jewish community center to the cemetery and formed a human chain around the cemetery with signs that said, we will not be defined by the fanatics in our midst. There has never been another desecration of that cemetery and just recently, those that were involved were actually arrested. They were members of Chrissy Avgi, Golden Dawn, which is a neo-fascist group in Greece now. They're being tried in the courts. Um, to their credit, the Greek government has tried to do everything possible to confront the rise of anti-Semitism on the local level. The mayors of many cities, especially Yanis uh, Batadis, <coughs> in Salonika, who was actually beaten up in the street by some of these neo-Nazis because he was speaking out for the Jews. He took his second oath of office wearing a Mogan David on his chest to remind the citizens of Salonika about the lost Jewish presence in the city. He's worked conscientiously to enable the creation of a Holocaust education center there, traveling all over the world to raise money. By the way, we're getting it. And it's very interesting where the money is coming from. Yanis Boutadis went to the Stavros Niakos Foundation that gave 10 million euros. And then we recently received 10 million euros from Germany. Germany, who said they paid all the restitutions they're ever going to pay, and they're not paying a cent. But when David Saltiel, the president of the Jewish community of Salonika, went to speak at the German parliament, he simply told them, if I was you, I'd give some money. The amount, what had happened is they found under the platform train station in Auschwitz-Birkenhelm cartons of railroad tickets that the Jews had to buy to take them to their deaths at Auschwitz-Birkenhelm. Pictures of those were shown to the German parliament and they said what we want now is the equivalent in money of what those tickets would be worth today. 10 million euro later, going towards the Holocaust Education Center. You know, we're stubborn people and we're strong people. I'm saying this as Jews, not just as Greek Jews. We may be a little more stubborn, a little stronger, but still, we don't give up easy. We wouldn't be here today if we gave up so easily. You had another question. Well, uh, following up on that, um, the great colonels who were fascists in control for mm -hmm. a decade, yeah. um, they didn't find any Jewish opposition to their fascism, and how close was their fascism to uh, Nazism, and did any Jews feel they had to leave the country like so many other Greeks did? You know, I'll tell you, most of the Jews that were, well, first of all, there were very few Jews left at that point during the 19, uh, late 1960s and, and 1970s. Um, most of the Jews that left the country, who survived the Holocaust, 
left with the advent of the State of Israel in 1948, and then afterwards where there were uh, highest rescued Jews in Greece that, um, during the earthquakes in 1955 and 56. So there were really very few Jews left. Uh, you know, in some ways this sort of works to our advantage unless you meet up with a really ignorant taxi cab driver in Greece. I have more fun with this because I'm fluent in the language. And sitting in a cab, coming from Piraeus to, uh, to Athens, he noticed by my accent that I was not a native Greek speaker. He asked me where I was from. I said the United States. He then didn't know I was Jewish. He then took it upon himself to tell me the Jews are taking over the country. Now, mind you, there's 4,500 Jews in all of Greece in a, in a population of close to 11 million. And I said, really? Really? I said, how many Jews are there? He said, hundreds of thousands. So I had, happened to have had a meeting with David Sotheo, who's also president of the Central Board of Jewish Communities of Greece. And I said, David, where are they getting, because it wasn't the first time I heard this. I said, where are they getting these figures from? He said, shh. We want them to think we're stronger than we really are. <laughs> so sometimes a little lie here and there. You know, getting back to the, the colonels, um, so many people left Greece during that point to escape the fascism. And um, the irony with this neo-Nazi group now, Chrissy Avgi, there's a village in the Peloponnese uh, Karadiko, that was almost completely destroyed by the Nazis. When I say almost completely destroyed, there were some German soldiers that had been killed by the resistance movement. They went into the village, they rounded up all the men in the village and executed them. Some of these idiots that are now with Chrissy Avgi came from that village. They don't know their own history. My biggest complaint is how this party was allowed to have 11 seats in, in the Greek parliament and enter the Greek parliament giving the Nazi salute. That to me is horrible. It should never have taken place. And the answer you get from Greece is we're a democracy, freedom of the speech. The same thing as we have here. How can we allow these idiots, these Nazis to parade in the street? Freedom of speech. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. You mentioned that before, that, I mean, to me, that you had addressed in Washington uh, yeah. in the Rayburn Center. Do you want to just mention that? Sure. I had, uh, you know, Yom HaShoah, it's interesting. How many of you know why the date was chosen for Yom HaShoah? It's usually in April. It's the anniversary of the uprising of the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, in Europe now, they have what's known as the International Day of Commemoration of the Holocaust. And it's usually around January 27th, which is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So, you know, dates are chosen for specific reasons. If anything, Jews stop, we mourn, we commemorate Yom HaShoah. It's really pretty much a Jewish thing. The International Day of Commemoration of the Holocaust is a national thing. Countries who have signed on to this, Greece included, throughout Europe, there are speeches in Parliament. Many times schools are closed. The whole country mourns the loss of their Jewish citizens. Now in the United States, this is remembered January 27th, or at least during the week of January 27th in the UN. It's also remembered in Congress. This year, in Congress, it was the remembering of the losses of Sephardic and Roman Yo Jews. And I was asked to be the keynote speaker, which everybody thought was a big deal. By the way, there was not one congressperson there. They gave us a room. And um, <laughs> what happened is, I'm a stickler for accuracy, and I was maybe the fourth or fifth speaker, and those before me, I, I couldn't believe all the mistakes that were being made. So when I got up there, I was a little irritable. 
And I mentioned that I had been at Yad Vashem for, I go on a regular basis to Congress uh, conferences there. And a number of years ago, the theme of the conference was um, get it right. We're losing our survivors. We do not have the luxury of making mistakes. So I told them, get it right. And then I went around the room to point out all the mistakes that were made. What I really enjoyed while I was in DC is the Greek embassy invited me to speak there. And I did the whole program on the Romaniotes. And I'm bringing that to Boston, to the consulate there next year. He invited me to speak there. I'll let you know the day. And I will also be doing it at the consulate in New York City and um, coming back to speak at the Greek embassy when we have an exhibit there. I go anywhere. I'm the true wandering Jew with a big mouth. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, I've been all over the world with this. Um, we were a very small population. We're a small population now. When you look at statistics of world Jewry, I think they give the statistic of about 15 million worldwide, about 6 million in the United States, about the equivalent in Israel, and then small communities elsewhere. Of those 15 million Jews, According to Israel statistics, they say over half the Jews in, in Israel are Sephardic, but that's because they count everybody except, you know, not Ashkenazi. Roman Jews worldwide, and I'm going to be very generous with this number, worldwide, they might be maybe 10,000 out of 15 million. And I'm being generous because in many, we have very, very few purebred Romano Jews where both their mother and father, were you, are you purebred or did, did, yeah? Okay, so we have the, the Maza over there. Uh, Judy or not, okay. Uh, but very, very few, have you had your DNA taken? No, I'm gonna send you a kit. There's, well, there's two studies going on and it won't cost you a thing. Two studies are going on now. I can only do the male line, though. And, um, one is on the uh, migratory paths of Roman Yod and Sephardic Jews in the Balkans, and the other one is on Roman Yod Jews. Done with a, by a, a, a relative of you, Jonathan Akatata is part of that project. He's from the Culture Mero family, too. Um, the other side, yeah, yes, right, okay. Um, you know, just a little aside, the surnames of Roman Jews, I hit upon a little bit when it came to um, relating to Passover. Your name, Maza, how do you pronounce P-I-Z-Z-A? Pizza, as if it had a T. It really is matzah, but the Maza spelling comes from somehow along the migratory route, your family was in Italy came into, into Greece, which is there were many, many that did. There were those that came from parts of Sicily. I'm, I'm doing research now in uh, Syracuse, where there were many Roman Jews that wound up in Yana that came from Syracuse. And in other parts of Italy, there were Jews that came from Apulia into Corfu. My feeling is you have more of the Corfu Italian connection there. Um, Asser is very easy. Male Hebrew first name that became a surname. That's, that's most of them in Yadra, that was the case. And then you have the strange names like Colchimero that comes from the prayer that said, when we separate the leaven from the unleaven at the start of, before we start Passover, from the Kalkamira prayer. And according to the oral history of the family, the patriarch of the family was so picky in picking out his fabrics that they said to him, it's like you're saying the Kalkamira prayer. So he became Kalkamira. The family name was actually Matathias. You know, there were so many of, of the community of 4,000, everybody at its height, four or 5,000, everybody was related to each other by marriage or by blood. And because of the way they named, and by the way, let me put this to rest for my Ashkenazi friends in the audience here. We, Sephardim and Roman Yotes, do not name our children after the living. We honor our mother and father. 
and we pray that they are alive to appreciate the honor. There is nothing in Halakha about the naming of children. You should have seen my, um, my ex-mother-in-law's face when I was naming my daughter after my mother. And guess what? My mother-in-law and my mother had the same Hebrew name. So my daughter has two Hebrew names. I don't know what the other one was, but that side of the family went to the synagogue and got another Hebrew name for her. But we don't name after the living. You know, it does. I, I know because you know why? Because among the Ashkenazim, to give the name to a child of someone who's still alive is a shanda. You know, but to us, it's a blessing to be able to have that parent. And now, Greeks, you do the same thing. You name your firstborn child. The son is named after the father's father. The daughter is named after the, fa uh, the father's mother. And then it goes forth from there. So I carry my grandmother, my Nona's name. But she was deceased, right? She was deceased. Yeah. No, hers was. Sorry. Yeah. Mine, wasn't. mine wasn't either. Mine wasn't, yeah. They name, okay, they name after their, their parents. Even if they're living. Even if they're living. Hopefully that they're li it's living. An honor. It's an honor. It's an honor to, to give yeah. your child that name. And I'll tell you, it forges a special bond. Yeah. Because I, I was very close to my Nona, my grandmother, yeah. who, by the way, my given name is Marika, but thanks to the nice Ashkenazi woman in the next bed, to my mother helping her fill out the birth certificate. When I went to school the first day and didn't hear my name, I found out I was Marsha Haddad instead of, instead of Marika Haddad. <laughs> and being a, a child of immigrants, you didn't question anything. You know, I questioned my mother, what did you do? How did you, you know, but that was it. Um, no, you, um, it forms a bond. My daughter is named after my mother. The bond was so strong there that when my daughter was pregnant and I said, because I wanted to be called Nona, and my daughter said, no, I can't. Because my mother had passed. She says, every time I hear Nona, I start to cry. They had such a strong bond with each other. There's something about not only did I share her name, I shared her bed. Um, here she would tell me the stories about how we were aristocracy. And not only did I not have my own room, like my brothers, the Pashas did, but I didn't even have my own bed. I shared it. But I'll tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that in for anything. What I learned from that very special lady, it's so important. Well, thank you. Thank you all. It's been my pleasure. <laughs>